Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming uh, for our Sinalo seminar by Professor Nibu Tai. So my name is Yi Xiang Kan, the deputy director of Sinalo, uh, working on the memory engagement. So before we start the talk today, so I would like to uh, acknowledge and pay my respect to the um, traditional owner of the land on which we met, the Gallego people of Iran Nation, upon their ancestral land where the Sinalo is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, research, and practice within the, this university, may we also pay our respect to the knowledge embedded forever uh, within, with the uh, original uh, custodianship of the country. Now, uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Wei Bo Chao, is, uh, is a uh, last distinguished achieve, achievement professor of radiology, medical physics, material science, and engineering, which crossing all the faculty, uh, and, uh, and the pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. His research on molecular imaging and nanobiology technology has resulted in over 380 papers uh, uh, with uh, over 36,000 citations and over three digits in the uh, He has awarded with many honors and serving uh, on the editor board of 20 international journals. So today, Professor Tai will give us a talk on his uh, research work and on the serenotics with uh, radio, ra radio labeled nanomaterials. Thank you. My camera is broken. Well, great. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation and for the for the kind of introduction. I've I've always uh, heard of uh, I've always heard of City Nano and uh, I haven't been here and finally I'm here. It's just really impressive infra infrastructure. Really beautiful building, and also it's really great to come to Sydney again. It's just uh, beautiful. And last night I saw this in color. It's, it's really impressive. And I think I was here about uh, one year ago, exactly the same, roughly about the same time. Ever since I was a kid, uh, elementary school, I've seen photos like this, and I always wanted to come to Sydney. And 40 years later, I'm here. Uh, that was last year. And so last year I walked around a little bit because that's a beautiful dining harbor, and at night, and those buildings they change colors. It's just incredibly beautiful city. And I think uh, there are also you know, uh, many, many uh, Chinese uh, aspects and uh, students, uh, also a lot of people from China living, living here. And the beautiful, I think that's a friendship garden uh, in the Chinatown area. And I think this photo really summarizes Sydney, in my opinion. It's a mixture of East and West. It's also a mixture of tradition and modern. So it's kind of a fusion of everything. Like, you know, we're all living on the same planet and we work, uh, live harmoniously together. So I really kind of like this photo, because that to me really represents, represents what Sydney is about. So last year when I, when I left, and I, I'm pretty sure that's Bondi Beach, or maybe other beach, I'm not sure which one. But I felt I really want to come back again, and then I'm really happy that I'm here again. And this year I'm here a few days earlier, so I was able to enjoy a bit Sydney, while last year I wasn't, uh, we, I was here after that ended. So in, as a disclosure, I work with a few different companies. I play multiple different roles. Uh, I'm an editor in chief of BNB, also associated with, uh, with uh, the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. And both of these are part of the Australian nature family of journals. I also started a journal called Asian MMI. Hopefully, that's going to have an impact factor somewhere around this uh, end of June. That's when the new impact factor will be uh, announced. Uh, as a background, I got my training from UC San Diego. I have to say, San Diego is very much like Sydney. It's beautiful weather, kind of modern, and it's a very nice place to live. When I was a PhD, uh, my PhD was in organic chemistry. So basically, I worked on peptides, uh, kind of uh, biomimetic peptides for biomaterial applications. And afterwards, I moved to Stanford University. I did a postdoc for three years. And I was mostly working on molecular imaging. And uh, this is a kind of a, some of the major areas of molecular imaging, say image metabolism, for example. FTG is something that's used in the clinic routinely for cancer and other diseases. Well, when I was a postdoc, I was mostly working on targeting cell surface receptors using peptides, proteins, antibodies, antibody fragments for imaging or therapy applications. <clears throat> so my first postdoctoral project was actually a kind of a combination of my PhD work and also a little bridging my PhD work uh, with the, the imaging aspect. So basically, we use a commonly used RGT peptide that can bind to integral alpha beta 3. We link that with the quantum dot that's the infrared, and then that's AFM images to show they're monodispersed and they're not aggregating. Stay in the cells, tissue, in vivo imaging, x vivo imaging, 
here you see the tumor of that mouse when we have RGB as the targeting molecule, while this is a tumor that's basically not by signal if you don't have RGD, just to confirm uh, specificity. And after that, uh, uh, we also worked on, in collaboration with Professor Hong Chi Dai's lab, who's been the leading expert in carbon nanotubes, graphene, and many other materials. Uh, that time, Zhuang Liu was uh, my longtime best friend. He was a uh, PhD student. So we worked together on carbon nanotubes as well. So basically, they make the carbon nanotubes. We do the radio labeling, imaging, this kind of studies. And we did the radio labeling. In this case, we use copper 64. That's a radio isotope with a 12 hour half life. So typically, you can image four half lives or maybe even six half lives if you really stretch to it. So, with that 12 hour half life, we can image longer, maybe up to 48 hours. But in this case, I'll just show you the first uh, 24 hours. When we coat the nanotube, that's NT, with the RGD, and we have the 2K, that means 2000 molecular weight tag linker. It does separate uh, for quite some time. We can see some tumor targeting, but it's not optimized. If we have a longer pack, 5,000 molecular weight pack, it's much more water soluble, has much longer circulation. You can see the blood flow activity is much higher. So all of those images are on the same scale. The bright image means higher signal, so there's more blood flow activity at early time points, and also the tumor uptake was much higher compared to shorter pack. We also did all kinds of control experiments to make sure it's image specific. So that's our study group. Those are all kinds of different control groups to make sure it's specific. And also to make sure it's targeting the integral after beta three. So after that, uh, I started my independent faculty position uh, in uh, 2008. I moved from California to Wisconsin. That's kind of California. It's kind of like Sydney like, during daytime. It's like 20 degrees, 25 degrees. It's all year round, it's like same weather. But when you go to Wisconsin, that was a that was a year was a record snowfall, and it's uh, it's quite cold. So when I was in Wisconsin, the first thing I needed to buy was a snow shovel, because the snow was literally taller than me on the ground. <laughs> and at AW Madison, my research is mostly uh, kind of this our group website. You're more than welcome to take a look. That's Wisconsin. That's molecular imaging. It's very short and easy to remember. It's very hard to make it shorter. I could go for I with maybe uh, <laughs> if, if I want to make it shorter. So we work on three areas, molecular imaging, nanobiotechnology, and molecular therapy, kind of like diagnostic imaging and therapy combined. We mainly focus on cancer, but we also work on many other diseases. I'll show you some examples uh, later. In terms of imaging, this is a review article we wrote a few years ago in Angamonte, talking about multimodality imaging agents, and we primarily work on PET, the polytransmission tomography. Uh, basically, it's a... Uh, it uses the isotope that it is a polytron, and then uh, that is quantitative, sensitive, and also could be clinically translated. Meanwhile, we also work on other techniques like MR, magnetic resonance, PA, photoacoustic, and also optical. Those mostly serve as the validation of the PET image. So we can do non invasive, in vivo, quantitative imaging with PET, while the, the other techniques can serve as a cross validation. But if you work on cancer, I'm sure you're all familiar with the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, there are many of them, and uh, one of them is the vasculature, increase the vasculature. So basically that's a development of new blood vessels from the existing blood vessels, because all solid tumors will require this uh, angiogenesis to grow beyond certain size. And so we worked uh, quite a bit on this uh, vasculature related targets, for example, integral and alpha beta 3 is one of them. When I, was, uh, when I became a faculty, we also worked on uh, other targets. One target is called CD105. That's also on the active proliferating uh, vasculature. And for that and for that target, we use an antibody called TRC105. That's an intact antibody, monoclonal antibody. We use that for targeting. And we can label the antibody with a variety of different radioisotopes. One of them we tried was uh, Zirconium 89, which has about a three day half life. So it's actually good for antibodies because antibodies circulate for quite some time. It takes many days. So three days is actually a very good uh, 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 half-life for the radioisotopes. The labeling is quite straightforward. This is commercially available, Despro agent. We link that to the amino group on the lysine side chain. We have this Despro conjugated TRC-105. And then one step conjugation, we have the zirconium labeled uh, TRC-105. Zirconium really likes oxygen atoms. So here we have six oxygen atoms coordinated with zirconium. Might also be two water molecules, just eight coordination sites. So when we inject this zirconium labeled TRC-105 in vivo, 
you can see that uh, this is a whole body image. There's really nothing to hide in the whole body. At point four hours, we can see the tumor already kind of reached the peak that's the brightest spot. There's a little bit of blood flow activity because it does circulate for quite some time. Four days later, you can see it drops. Uh, the blood flow activity is clear, but the tumor still remains very high. That's confirmed by the ex vivo studies. So over the years, we've worked on radio label TLC-105 for a variety of different applications. For example, we can use that to image antigenesis in many different solid tumor types. We could also use the same probe here where we're imaging tumor antigenesis. We can also use that to image cardiovascular disease because there's a lot of antigenesis ongoing in certain diseases. Uh, we worked on peripheral artery disease, myocardial infarction, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, here we're doing imaging, which is a PET isotope, which is a colon. If we switch the colon to a therapeutic isotope, you can deliver a lot of radiation dose to the tumor, while the normal tissue has very little uptake, so it has very low toxicity, so that could be used for radioimmunotherapy. We've also done quite a bit of that. We could also use imaging as a tool to monitor therapy, so if we apply a drug, that can stimulate or inhibit angiogenesis. We can scan the same group of mice as before and afterwards. You, uh, you can see up increasing signal or decreasing signal, depending on what disease model they are using and what drug they are using. And we also have done a little bit of that. So over the years, we worked our, uh, with many different isotopes. We have a good collaborator at UW Medicine, the, the Cytron group. They've made many different isotopes over the years. They've made actually over 200 different isotopes over the last 40 years. We worked closely with them on many different isotopes. On um, this slide is pretty much everything we've published um, in terms of the radioisotopes shown in blue. They have different half life So if you want to image shorter time periods, say a few hours up to half a day, we can use short-lived isotopes, such as copper 61 at three hours, or scanning 44, that's four hours. If you want to image, say, two days, uh, 48 hours, we can use medium half-life radioisotopes, say copper 64, that's half a day, or yttrium 86, that's also about uh, 15 hours. If you want to label antibody, like I just mentioned before, we can use antibody, we can use isotopes with longer half-life, a few days. There's a column 89, about three days, or magnesium 52, that's about uh, five days. But on a weekly basis, we work with copper 64 and the column 89. Because our second group makes this on a weekly basis and they ship it and sell it to many other universities or hospitals or institutions within the US uh, via FedEx overnight. So they make it on Monday, everybody else get it on Tuesday. And this is a group uh, photo from their website. That's uh, Jerry Nichols. Uh, he's very well known in radioisotope production. He retired many years ago. And then Jonathan Engel is a tenured associate professor now and he's in charge. So we're going to uh, work together for the for maybe could be a few decades uh, in the in the in the future. Uh, we've also worked on many different uh, as I showed you many of the different the radio isotopes we've we worked on. I'll just show you some examples using the non-standard isotopes, meaning it's not F18, not cadmium 68, it's something that's um, not very commonly used. For example, we use copper 61, that's a three-hour half-life. We can use that to label antibody fragments. Uh, because antibody fragment is uh, much smaller, uh, so it's simply for less time. We can use a short lived isotope. We could also use a uh, scanning 44, that's a three hour half life, that's also uh, can be used for labeling antibody fragment or uh, uh, peptide. Vitrium 86, that's a 12, 14 hour half life, and we can use that to label a monoclonal antibody. And the exact same labeling can be used to label yttrium 90 that can be used for therapy. So we can use the exact same chemical entity, one for imaging, which is yttrium 86, one for therapy, which is uh, yttrium 90. We've also worked a little bit on diabetes. And in this case, we use a radioactive manganese uh, isotope, manganese 52. We could also use manganese 51. So basically they are the same element, so the same chemistry, same biology, but just different physical properties or different decay properties. So this is something we're trying to translate into a clinic. We also worked on cadmium 66. That's a nine hour half-life. We can use that to label short-lived, uh, short circulating antibodies or nanomaterials. Also on titanium 45, we can use that to label certain nanomaterials. In terms of disease models, over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, we worked on many different disease models in terms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and some other diseases as well. Uh, the only thing we are translating into the clinic at UW Medicine is, is a diabetes, uh, kind of, say, beta cell transplantation. 
if you want to see whether the beta cells are alive, uh, manganese uh, chloride. We have some quick clinical data to show that it may tell you whether the beta cells are alive or not. We'll have to find that out in, a, in the human studies. I've also collaborated with a group that makes uh, nano generators. That's uh, basically it's a tiny device. You can harvest the biological energy, so breathing motion, uh, muscle motion, heartbeat movement, etc. And we can use that, the little amount of electricity or the current generated, we can use that for many different biomedical applications. So basically, they make the nano generators. We do the animal studies, mice, rats. We also work with our large animal facility to work on a pig model. We have worked on uh, bone healing, bone fracture healing, weight loss, hair regeneration, and could also be for others as well. Uh, in terms of targets that I work, we've worked on over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, those are pretty much all the targets we're published on, showing in red are related to angiogenesis, uh, like integral alpha, beta 3, or VEGF, or CD105. Shown blue are in related to the tumor immuno cancer immunotherapy. That has been really hot over the last uh, decade or so. So those are immunotherapy related targets. Or everything is black. Everything black is uh, overexpressed either proteins or receptors on the cancer cells. And in terms of the targeting ligands, we usually use a biological molecule. So as small as the peptide, say RGT peptide or some other peptide, all the way to an antibody or antibody drug conjugate, and basically everything in between. Uh, so a few years ago, we summarized that uh, in a chemical review article talking about immunopat. It's basically using uh, antibodies or antibody fragments for pandemic implications. We're talking about uh, concept design applications. So Wei Jinwei was a visiting PhD student. He's an MD PhD student from uh, Shanghai Jiaotong University. He visited my lab for one year. After he went back to China, he started writing this uh, massive review with almost a thousand references. And uh, the published paper was probably uh, like 60 or 70 pages. And uh, it's, uh, it took a long time, but uh, he was uh, promoted from a resident, the nuclear medicine, you go from resident to assistant professor to associate professor. He was promoted from a resident director to associate professor, so he skipped the assistant professor. At the Shanghai Jordan University, really one of the best in China. And I'm really proud of uh, his achievement. And we're still working together on a lot of different things because now he's independent. He also has more resources for clinical translation. So we work uh, quite a bit on certain trans translational projects, like antibodies or antibody fragments or maybe peptides uh, for first in human studies. So that's basically a little bit of everything, kind of show you some flavor of what we did in terms of the imaging aspect. The rest will all be something nanoparticle related. Uh, we've worked on many different nanomaterials. One of them is a mesoporous silicon nanoparticles, and this can be used for uh, drug delivery kind of applications. And for example, we have this mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. We can link that with the antibody I just mentioned, TRC105 for tumor vasculature targeting. We can use that to load the doctorism, which is a model drug, and we can measure the release. And here are the TM images to show that they are quite model dispersed. Uh, it's about 80 to 100 nanometers in diameter. And in, in, we can radio label them, just like I showed you with antibodies, to quantify uptake in different tissues. Here is the targeting group with the high uptake in the tumor, non targeted, much lower uptake. We can block that by adding, injecting excess amount of the unlabeled antibodies. So this will bind to its target while this antibody has no place to bind. And we can see a much lower uptake. We also quantify that data ex vivo. We can see higher tumor uptake of the doxal region comparing to the non targeted group. So everything matches quite well to suggest. So we have a cross validation. We have PET for non invasive imaging, while the optical can be used for uh, ex vivo validation. So this is a review article we wrote almost 10 years ago. Um, basically, summarizes everything we did about tumor targeting with nanomaterials. And we focus on targeting the tumor vasculature. Uh, up until 10 years ago, we worked on pollen dots, carbon nanotubes, nanografting, myself, silicon nanoparticles. So all of them can be targeted to the tumor, uh, tumor vasculature. We have three different systems. For example, IgG peptide for integral alpha beta 3, TRC105, the antibody I mentioned for CD105, or VEGF for VEGF receptor targeting. And in all cases, with the higher take in the tumor, uh, in the targeting group, while the low uh, non-targeted group have a much lower tumor. 
So essentially, we try to maximize the API effect if it's there. Now, this debatable how much API effect is there in tumor or how much it is uh, relevant. And honestly, it doesn't matter much, but we're targeting tumor vasculature, which is uh, uh, the target is accessible immediately upon intravenous injection, so we don't really need the API effect point to work. Um, so on top of the passive targeting, we add vasculature targeting, and that can increase the tumor uptake by a certain amount. It depending on how much is the tumor target uh, passive targeting level, what model you're using. If there's no passive targeting, we're talking about four difference. It could be five or tenfold. If there's a lot of passive targeting, we may just increase it by ten percent, twenty percent. So it, it varies, but nonetheless, it always works to a certain extent. So that basically, that once I covered everything we did on nanoparticle targeting of tumor, we focused on the vasculature. And the other area that we spent a lot of time on over the last 10 years is something we call intrinsically radio label nanomaterials. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, you've heard a lot of criticism to the nanomedicine field, saying there are so many papers, and very few get into the clinic or maybe get uh, approved as drugs. Of course, there are many different reasons for that. For example, nanomaterials are so complicated, it's very hard or maybe impossible to make GMP, depending on the design. It's very expensive. But I think another major reason is that for most of those nanomedicine papers if you, uh, in the literature, they don't really know the whole body distribution of the nanomaterial. While from an FDA perspective, it's really important to be safe. So they need to know the body distribution, need to know the clearance. And if you don't have a good way of measuring that, it's going to be very difficult. So we've spent quite, in my opinion, the best way to measure that quantitatively in vivo is based on radio labeling because it's quantitative and sensitive. Uh, but of course, uh, if you do it, the label in the conventional method, for example, if you label the codon, we need to conjugate a desperate or chelator. So we need to conjugate it, purify it, label it, purify it. it. makes the whole process even more complicated. So it's even harder for that to be GMP uh, if we are ever moving towards that direction. So we worked on something called intrinsically radio label and nanomaterials. Basically, we want to keep the process simpler. So maybe it's going to help with some translation uh, down the road. Uh, whenever we start a new project, we, add, uh, we always have a student or postdoc write a review article on the topic so that we know what has been done. And when we're reading those papers, we'll have some ideas about what we could do in the future that's different. And uh, so this review we wrote about 10 years ago that covers, we, cut, we cited every single paper we could find in the topic. And they are divided into several different categories that we can call intrinsically radio label nanomaterials. Uh, basically, on a radio label nanomaterial, we don't need a chelator. Uh, we don't need a microcycle to wrap the isotope around. So that's one. Or when we mix the nanoparticles, the chelator is already incorporated. So we don't need an additional step of chelator conjugation purification. So that can make it simpler. So both of these can be uh, called intrinsically radio label nanomaterials. And then when we first started on this, that about 10 years ago, that's from pattern mass and uh, uh, available in the clinic. So we thought we were going to do some pattern mass agent, just as a proof of principle. So make those uh, ionside nanoparticles, that's for ammo. Our collaborator can make the arsenic. That radioactive arsenic can be used for pediminium. So mix those together, they bind very tightly. But there's some proof of principle since the lymph node mapping studies. You can see the lymph node. Uh, it stays for quite some time. And this pet imaging, we're measuring the radioisotope, while this MR, we're measuring the ionside nanoparticle. On this side, nothing was injected. So the lymph node is the same. Or here, the lymph node was bright in the beginning. When there is ion oxide, it becomes darker. So they match it quite well, uh, suggesting that even though it's just simple mixing, it's quite stable in vivo. And I also mentioned that we've labeled uh, the codon uh, with uh, the dashboard chelator, which is this. And uh, we've also worked on silica based nanoparticles. So we thought, you know, maybe we can use the oxygen in the silica. To coordinate with the colon, so we don't really need a desperate. And that actually worked quite well. Uh, basically, if we, we did a rough calculation for a meat support silicon nanoparticle, that's roughly about 100 nanometers in diameter, there are about 3 million oxygen items in the whole nanoparticle. And 90% of them are inside mesial channels, like only 10% of them are on the surface. So when there's oxygen in, when those oxygen that's coordinated with the colon, it's mostly hidden inside the mesial channel, like hidden in a cave. So it's not exposed to the outside environment. So it's actually quite stable in vivo. And we've tested that for 
several weeks in animal, we don't really see any of the volume coming out. We can optimize the labeling conditions like concentration, temperature, uh, time, for example. So with that in hand, we can label it very easily. Uh, we don't have to worry about labeling. We can do something a lot more complicated. And this also revealed like, uh, many years ago, talking about radio label nanomaterials, different kind of applications, imaging therapy, drug delivery, for example. Uh, I'll show you one example we did in this area is basically a kind of composite type of nanomaterials. We have this uh, hollow piece of polycyclic nanoparticles. So the center is a big cavity, you can load a lot more drugs. And this basically is silica oxide. And we can modify the, we can label the zirconium as the first step. So the zirconium goes in here and it's coordinated by the oxygen atoms. And we can uh, modify the silica nanoparticle so it has amine groups on the circuit or on the pulse. So it's negatively, positively charged. We can also make small copper sulfide nanoparticles that's uh, coated with citrate that's negatively charged. So they uh, have ele electronic interactions. We can have a lot of those uh, copper sulfide on the surface. We can also load it inside with a, a photodynamic therapy agent called TCPP. And then we coat that with a pack that's much, really a long pack, 10,000 molecular weight. So it's more water soluble, biocompatible. And then we can inject that into an animal. And this nanomaterial is relatively straightforward process, can be used for multi-modality imaging and also multi-modality therapy. In terms of imaging, head imaging, we can image the zirconium 89 fluorescence, can image this uh, small molecule dye. This is a Schoenkopf luminescence, it's basically an optical scanner. You can use optical scanner to image the radioisotope. So we can do optical imaging of a radioisotope. That's the Schoenkopf luminescence. And that light can be used to excite TCPP so we can have uh, energy transfer. So we can have four different imaging techniques looking at different aspects of this nanomaterial. Or right, for therapy, we can use photothermal therapy. That's uh, using our copper sulfide. And for photodynamic therapy, we're using TCPP. So we can also have a combination therapy. And here is the TM structures. The hollow piece of polycyclic nanoparticles may be about 150 nanometers in diameter. Well, this copper sulfide is only about five nanometers or less in diameter, so it's much smaller. And this is a TEM of the final structure. You can see a lot of dots, those are all copper sulfide on the, uh, on the silicon nanoparticle. That could be maybe a hundred of them, or at least uh, 50 or more of them. And then for photothermal therapy, we use a 980 laser that's exciting copper sulfide. Or for the photodynamic therapy, we use 660 laser. That's exciting the TTPP. This is the radio labeling stability studies. Those are images with four different techniques looking at different aspects. And this is looking at the energy transfer. So the signal is much lower compared to without transfer. And those are kind of everything matches what we expect it to be. And then we inject it in vivo with the therapy studies. If we just use photothermal therapy or photodynamic therapy, we don't use a maximum intensity, so we don't really shrink the tumor, we just stop the tumor from growing that, those two curves. If we combine those together, we can immediately shrink the tumor and then it doesn't come back. Uh, and all the mice survive in this uh, combination therapy group, while all the other mice died at a certain time point. We also calculate the synergistic effect, basically whether that's 1 plus 1 equal 2 or whether it's 1 plus 1 greater than 2. And we found that uh, there are Definitely a very strong synergistic effect. The biological maximum, we didn't really have the, uh, the facility to study that, so we don't really know exactly what's happening. Uh, but it, it is, uh, uh, we found that it is indeed synergistic. So those are size of the tumors, toxicity, et cetera. So basically, the nanomaterial itself is not toxic until we apply for the thermal therapy or for the dynamic therapy. So over the years, uh, we worked on silicon nanoparticles for many different uh, types of sizes. So MSF, mesopolar polycyclic nanoparticles, all of these polycyclic nanoparticles that I just mentioned. We can also make the pore much larger, so it can be biodegradable. That's biodegradable mesopolar polycyclic nanoparticles. We can also make it ultra small polycyclic nanoparticles. So all of them is silica oxide. So there's oxygen there already. And then we can easily modify the surface or the pores so it can contain nitrogen or sulfur. So whatever radio metal you're labeling, when you use a microcyclic chelator, it's always either oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur, or a combination of these two. This is a two or three. So we can easily modify any kind of silicon nanoparticle to contain those. 
And this can be used to label a variety of different uh, radio metals. And uh, shown here, some are for imaging, some are for therapy. Therapy, for example, HM19, lutetium-177. I'm not saying we have labeled all of this, but we've labeled probably uh, uh, at least half of these uh, different isotopes. I'll just show you one example we did a few years ago. We have this uh, oxygen small pore sticker nanoparticles. This is about 10 nanometers or so in diameter. When it's that small, most of oxygen has to be on the surface. So if we do chelate it freely, bonding is not very stable. So we still need to use a conventional method, DOTA, which is a micro which is a microcyclic chelator here to label the radioactive. Uh, we can use that to label HM86 or HM90. So that's a TM structure. It's not as good for a donut as what I show here, but we can see some pores in most of the nanoparticles. And uh, when we label that with HM86, which is for imaging studies, you can see it's circling for quite some time. That's a heart, that's a blood vessels. So even at 12 hours, you still see a lot of blood flow activity. So it's circling for quite some time because it's about 10 nanometers or so in diameter. It's too small to be taken out, recognized by the liver, but it's too large to be cleared from the kidney. So it's separate for quite some time. And over after 24 hours, we see very high, high uptake in the tumor without any targeting at all. And since uh, the imaging is showing that tumor uptake is so high, higher than all the normal tissue, if we switch HM86 to HM90, kind of almost like an antibody, and we can uh, definitely delay the tumor growth. So this is also the true uh, theranostics, meaning uh, we have the same chemical entity for both imaging and the therapy. We just use different isotopes. That's the imaging isotope, that's the therapy isotope, and the rest is all the same. Each of them label silicon nanoparticles. And we also summarized that in a Council of Chemical Research Review a few years ago, talking about different ways to radio label silicon nanoparticles and its uh, application. Uh, we've also looked a little bit on bioresponsive nanomaterials. I guess I'll skip this one. Uh, basically, we can use imaging to measure the blood flow activity so we know how long it circulates. So to make sure it has enough time to respond to the tumor marking environment. Here we see at one hour or three hours, there's some blood flow activity. So it does have some time to respond. And we can use that as a tool to guide the therapy and we can shrink the tumor easily at the right time point. And we both, so that's oxygen, uh, so oxygen containing nanomaterials for labeling the column. So essentially, it seems that every kind of oxygen containing nanomaterials, we can use that to label the column without any chelator. So it's much simpler, just simple mixing, heating it up, heating it up. For copper, which is another isotope that people commonly use for pet imaging, we can also do that. So this is an example we did collaborating with uh, Professor Johnson over almost 10 years ago. I won't go into details. Basically, they have developed this agent that's for photoacoustic imaging. This is the molecule that can really absorb light. So that's good for photoacoustic imaging. And then the size is 20 to 50 nanometers in size. And the photoacoustic imaging can be a really good uh, kind of a spatial resolution. So you can have sub millimeter resolution. Also very good temporal resolution. So you'll see the mouse intestines contract about 30 times a minute, but it just doesn't give you good tissue penetration. That's where a pet can really come in. So the nanoparticles that they make, they ship it to us. We just mix it with copper for half an hour, 37 degrees. That's it, it's already labeled. The way it's labeled is because the molecule here in the middle is a porphyry-like structure. So they can uh, coordinate those metals. So when they make those nanomaterials, the chelate is already incorporated in it. So once they make it, they give it to us, we just do direct labeling. We don't need any additional modification. Even though it's very simple labeling, it's quite stable. We can collect the radio, uh, radioactivity after it's uh, oral gravas, because in this case, we're imaging the intestinal properties. You know, say 85 to 90 percent of radioactivity can be collected in the feces, so it's quite stable going through the heart's uh, digestive tract. So, PAT is a photoacoustic tomography, give you a good spatial resolution, temporal resolution, or PET is a pulse transmission tomography, give you very good uh, sensitivity. It's a uh, 3D, it's a uh, whole body. It's uh, also could be translated. So when you combine those two together, they are definitely very uh, complementary. Or in many cases, it could be uh, synergistic. I think we are quite familiar with the mRNA vaccines. Uh, pretty much, I guess, uh, pretty much all of them probably have that in our bodies some, some time over the last several years. And there was a really nice uh, article in Nature talking about the whole history of how this was developed. 
it's not a two-year process. It's like more than a decade or even over decades of people's work. And of course, the two key, two of the key persons are Catherine Draco, uh, really involved in modifying the mRNA, while Peter Coolis is a pioneer in the lipid nanoparticles. And when you look at the World Health Organization website, uh, that was a, a search that maybe a year and a half ago. There are actually a lot more than I was expecting. There are 130 in clinical development, and then uh, almost 200 in preclinical development. So it's not just the five or 10 that we know that have been approved. The vast majority of them didn't make it. But that's a kind of a common, I guess, in the drug development field. There are different kind of platforms, different techniques for immunization. Most of them are for intramuscular, just injecting the arm muscle generally. I want to search, when I prepared this slide uh, before I came, before I left home uh, last week, I looked at the website again, and uh, I have to say, to, a little bit to my surprise, you can see that the clinical studies of COVID vaccine that's currently still in clinical studies, it's actually more, like 130 to 180, while the preclinical is very much the same, about 200. And we actually played a small part in that as well. Now, I work with, as I mentioned, I work with Jonathan Novo for the last 10 plus years. So his staff is working on drug delivery, uh, imaging, and also he worked a little bit on nano vaccines. So over the years, they've worked on the, their own way of making new vaccines. And then in 2020, they also have a COVID vaccine. That's a, that was a, a, they started the company, raised money, getting ready for GMP, ready to be uh, tested for first in human studies. But the FDA asked them for biodistribution data. They want to see where it goes after doing some muscular injection. I'm pretty sure, uh, say Pfizer or Moderna or other companies, I don't think they provide any biodistribution distribution data, it's hard to imagine how they did that. But since if they ask you to do it, you just have to do it. And we worked together for the more than 10 years. Whenever they need a radio label, and they always came to, uh, came to us. So basically, their vaccine, essentially, that, this was a study done in October of 2020, which is really the worst time of COVID in the United States. We did the labeling for like half a day, and then we divided the division for seven days. Essentially, you just want to see it goes to the inguinal and lymph nodes. That's all there. That's the injection site. That's the lymph nodes. So we just want to make it sure it goes there. And then we'll take it for granted it goes there. But it's hard to have the data to prove that it goes there. So that's why we need to do the biologist region studies and then to see where it goes. So the way we label this was basically the same as I was just showed you in the previous paper we did 10 years ago. Basically, their liposomal vaccine, it contains certain uh, porphyrin phospholipids. So essentially, they take out this uh, phospholipid, the urine is two chains. They take out one chain, so this there can form uh, that liposome, or the other chain is the offering like structures, and this four nitrogen can coordinate with the metal. So basically, the, the vaccine they ship it to us, we just mix with copper, it's radio label, it's spice label, and we divide these studies. And that was actually finished phase one, two studies. I think they also finished phase three studies, or very close to that finished uh, phase three studies. So I'm very proud of this slide because uh, this did not get, lead us to any, uh, this did not lead me to any papers or anything, but it's something that we did that can actually make a difference in the real world, not just in animal studies. You might say that you know, COVID vaccines, COVID vaccines like too late, it, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's over or it's almost over. So what's the point of doing this? But of course, for all the vaccines, um, pretty much all the vaccines is kind of platform technology. You take out that COVID antigen, you plug in any other antigen, the same thing works. Like you basically pave the road for anything they can do in the future. So it could be a new variant of COVID or it could be a new antigen of other potential infectious disease. So this could, could next time they could be a lot faster because we can do the labeling imaging uh, immediately if they want to do it. Just like Moderna it's, has not been there for three years. It's been there for more than 10 or 15 years. It just takes time to build up the uh, to clear the obstacles to pave the road, so when the right time, time comes, maybe you can uh, really make use of the technology. So I'm very, really proud that something we worked on can actually make some difference in the clinical translation of certain agents. So over the years, we've worked on many different nanomaterials, and some are shown on this slide. We work uh, on basically all kinds of nanomaterials, some for imaging therapy, combination therapy, Bioresponsive that can respond to the human environment or biomimetic that can, uh, can uh, let's say, cell membrane coding nanomaterials, as well as the lipid nanoparticles for mRNA delivery. 
Why not? Everybody is working on the Finana particles for mRNA delivery. So we also work a little bit on that. And also, uh, today I'll show you a little bit of what we did on DNA nanomaterials. And of course, we are all familiar with the double helix of DNA HGCP base pairing. But if you know how to design nanomaterials, you can make, make that in all kinds of sizes, very elegant Chinese knot type of structures. Those are AFM, this is AFM image of pure DNA. You just need the right sequence uh, to self-assemble into this. Or in this case, you see like a, a, a bird with green flowers. You can make this into different kinds of sizes and shapes. But when we started working on this project, there has been very few biological applications of this. You can make the DNA nanostructures, but it's hard to make some use of this biomedically. So we thought we want to see where it goes in vivo, then maybe we can design some experiments to, uh, to, uh, for biomedical applications. So basically that's kind of folding DNA, just like when you're folding this kind of a paper crane. I have a whole loop of a virus you know, with small staple strands. Like uh, we tested several, we collaborated with three different groups. Uh, they are really leading, leading experts in their, uh, their, their, their corresponding fields. We test different sizes and shapes, rectangular, uh, DNA, or economic nanostructures, triangle, and also kind of a linear. Because they are super reproducible, that's AFM images. When we radio label this, it's interesting that we found that when we do the copper 6 four labeling, you can see the whole body is recent. Actually, all of them goes to the kidney very clearly. But if it's not perfect, it's a symbol. If the random loop, as I've shown you on this, it is a black one. If it's a random loop, it goes to the liver, as you would expect for a lot of nanomaterials. But when it's perfectly folded, it goes to the kidney. If we fold half of it, the other half is random, it also goes to the liver. So something special about perfectly folded DNA that just doesn't get recognized in the liver, it got trapped in the kidney. And the DNA, we know that can scavenge reactive oxygen species because when we do radiotherapy, we use radiotherapy to generate a reactive oxygen species and that can break DNA. So we kind of turn that around. We use, the, we know, you know, we use DNA to scavenge reactive oxygen species. They all work very much similarly. So the idea is that when we inject this DNA nanostructures intravenously, they got trapped in the kidney. And then the DNA in the kidney can scavenge the reactive oxygen species, so it could potentially prevent certain disease or could potentially treat some disease. So that's a kidney injury model that we use. And kind of long story short, uh, there's a lot of imaging and the data analysis to analyze the data to uh, to confirm that it actually works. So essentially, the long story short, the rectangular DNA gamma nanostructures give you quite good protective. Uh, capability, or maybe even therapeutic capability, but we just need to apply that as early phase of acute kidney injury because that's only within a few days the mouse will probably die if you don't do anything. So we have to do this early on, or maybe immediately before kidney injury. And we also measure the blood creatinine and the blood urea nitrogen levels to confirm that indeed it works. So this uh, is a histology confirm <coughs> that normal mouse kidney looks like this. Just by looking at it, you'll see that our treatment group, which is this one, looks much closer to this and all the other control groups, because the control groups have a lot of uh, damage. Uh, so essentially, uh, the DNA, just based on its pure biodistribution by itself, we didn't do anything to manipulate it or target it, it just got trapped in the kidney. And that can be used for, uh, for prevention of uh, kidney injury. So over the years, we've worked on many different nanomaterials that are kind of along the same realm. Those are shown uh, in some of these papers for the last eight or 10 years. Some nanomaterials can be either trapped in the kidney or can accumulate in the kidney or can go through renal clearance. If the nanomaterial can uh, scavenge the reactive oxygen species, they can pretty much perform the same action to prevent kidney injury or to, uh, to uh, kind of treat kidney disease. And we also summarize that in another kind of chemical research we will talk about different nanomedicines for the imaging and therapy of uh, uh, kidney disease. I guess I'm going to skip the liver part. So essentially, we use a natural tropism and then design the experiment to take advantage of the natural tropism. Uh, some nanomaterials can go to the liver, as we can see. And if that nanoparticle can scavenge reactive oxygen species, we can also use that to prevent or treat liver disease, for example, liver ischemia or perfusion injury. I won't go into details here. Essentially, if we have the nanomaterial, it can scavenge reactive oxygen species, so it can prevent 
a certain uh, injury. Or if it doesn't have the nanomaterial, there's going to be a lot of different things coming up, coming up that are quite bad. We can try different kind of nanomaterials. They all go to the liver by itself. We don't need to do any targeting of nanomaterials. Naturally, a lot of them just go to the liver. We just need to pick the right nanoparticle. And that can be used to prevent hepatic ischemia or the injury. Uh, this was on serial nanoparticles. Uh, this is kind of a carbohydrate derived uh, nano antioxidant. We've also worked with many different groups around the world on different things. And on this slide, everything, uh, we, we just did a part of it. So we're a part of a team. We're, we're not leading anything. Uh, so most of the time, my name is somewhere in the middle. We just participated in it. I'll show you a few representative examples. This was in collaboration with a cancer biologist uh, that was you know, published in Cancer Cell. The Rotor Review article was the leader of the field, Professor Xu Yang in China, uh, Nanozyme in Chemical Society Review. Uh, the nano generators that I was talking about was working with Professor Xu Dong Wang, and we did the biological experiments. They make nano generators. It can be used for bone fracture healing. This I just mentioned. That's our first collaborative paper with uh, Professor Jonathan Noble. And we also use radioisotopes to, uh, that can generate certain carbon and that can be used to excite certain things for cancer therapy. That's with a few groups in, uh, in China. We also, uh, last year, we also had a co author paper in science uh, that's again working together with Shudong Wang. We did some biology, biology experiments. I think as a professor, we all want our names to be uh, listed on Nature Cell of Science. So finally, we get there as a medium author. That's the first step. Someday, hopefully, I'll get there as a last author. It didn't mean I haven't tried. I tried multiple times. So far, never succeeded. So you just keep trying, keep trying. Maybe one day I'll break the wall. Uh, to summarize, uh, we do a lot of different things. Uh, but essentially, it's about imaging and therapy. All imaging, all therapy. Essentially, that's, that's it. Uh, Theranostic. In different diseases. So in our group, our best collaborator is a pet isotope production group. So we have many, many different isotopes we can use. I myself was trained in, uh, in chemistry, so I'm a chemist. In our group, we can also do some more biology. I'm a student from medical physics, so we could do radiation therapy, could do some modeling, the symmetry related studies. We also have some uh, uh, visiting a professor in the lab that can do some surgery uh, to generate certain more complicated models, so we're not limited to a uh, uh, to a xenograph model, so that maybe can help to move the manuscript up a certain level. We have many native speakers in the lab that can help to polish the manuscript so I don't have to correct it word by word. We make a lot of nanomaterials, and our uh, collaborators can ship us a lot of nanomaterials. I also have students or postdocs in engineering, say biomedical engineering or material science engineering. And uh, so, What's holding all these uh, puzzle pieces together, you can say, is molecular imaging because it does take a village to get this done properly. Nobody can do it alone. You may require all of this or some of this. You can also say it's nanobiotechnology because similarly, it's, again, it's not a one-man job. It takes a lot of people to do it. But in real life, I think you will probably agree that it's actually fun in uh, holding all this together. <laughs> and it's uh, always a constant battle. I'm sure you will agree with me on that. So to summarize, we work on many different things, imaging, therapy, and I do feel that intrinsically radio label nanomaterials could really help uh, to translate certain nanomaterials or could also prevent something from failure because uh, you really want to see the whole body by distribution or the targeting efficacy before you move forward. While a lot of literature have to say if they don't have a quantitative non-invasive measurement, if you look doing optical imaging, you're mostly looking at superficial tissue. You don't really see the deeper tissue. So some of the data may require some real analysis. And I'm really proud that we can help some groups to translate that into the clinic. Different imaging techniques. Uh, we're really not trying to compete with each other. I think we should use the techniques properly so they are at least complementary, if not synergistic. And translation, of course, is very challenging. It requires a lot of different things, infrastructure, leadership support, bonding, maybe a company or something. So it's not something we have at this point. You know, maybe in five, 10 years, we may have better resources. We may have a more effort on translation. So far, we don't have too much. Uh, just still working towards the first thing in the translation of one agent. I need to thank a lot of people. Uh, basically, our, the imaging, our collaborators, the imaging division, showing black out some of my, some of my uh, collaborators. It's not a comprehensive list. It's just a short list. And this is a green showing green are the funding agencies. 
It's in green because the US dollar is in green color. And that's the company we're familiar with. We also have more than 70 crew members over the years. This is a photo before the pandemic. This was actually 2017, if I remember correctly. Uh, we already like this photo because uh, you can see that everybody is happy. That's really important. But also because in this photo, we have people coming from seven different countries. Uh, United States, China, it's from Cuba, uh, India, Korea, Thailand, Brazil. And uh, over the years, we also have people coming from Denmark, Sweden, Turkey, Lebanon, Iran, and Israel. So we have uh, 13 countries represented in my 70 group members. So science is supposed to be without the borders, but in real life, if you read the news over the last several years, it's getting more and more complicated. So now we need to be more careful about certain collaboration. But nonetheless, we do collaborate with people all around the world. We just need to make sure we abide by all rules and disclose everything as needed. Uh, over the years, uh, we, have many people, we have many people coming uh, in and out. And I'm very proud that my group members have done very well after they left the lab. Uh, this is a list of, uh, of the former trainees, my students of postdocs. It does not include any visiting professors that already have their position before they joined that. So those are all new positions that got started after they left my lab as a student, as a postdoc. Of course, after student, they do a postdoc somewhere else and then become that. So last time I counted, our former trainees have eight full professors, three associate professors, and five assistant professors. And many of them are in industry as well. For example, Andy Aladdin graduated only a few years ago. He's now, just now already a scientific director of medical affairs in GI and College at Merck, one of the largest companies. So I'm very proud of what they have achieved. And they are really, uh, they work really hard. And uh, so I really appreciate that they spend the best years of their lives in our lab. And also I'm very happy that they moved on to better positions after they left our lab. And basically that's every single one of them over the last 15 years uh, in my group. And of course there will be more to come. The newest members that I did not talk about their work and not on this slide just yet. So in the future I need to create a second slide of the future member. So with that I'll stop here. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I'll definitely be happy to answer any questions. Thank you again. Yeah, take it from this side. Uh, this is it. Uh, from from Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for, for the very nice talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, thanks very much for this uh, wonderful talk. I could see that you like, don't have just diversity in people, but in your work as well, in terms of the area which you have covered, what kind of materials you may be in. We try to uh, maximize the output with the limited resources, so <laughs> if you can call it a limitation. <laughs> it is not limited. Okay. Now coming to the question, first my question is that you have shown that you have used radio label not just for imaging but for therapy purposes. Mm -hmm. So the one obvious question comes as a researcher is that how safe they are in the body in terms of therapy and when I say safe in terms of events and metabolism. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for, you know, let's say, uh, Everything could be toxic at a certain level, say if we drink water too much, it could also be toxic. Or radiation, any, you know, anything we work with that's really active is heavily like a there's a heavy oversight, like you need to have a license or like some kind of certification for handling radioactivity. Also the radiation safety office, we also need to do a like you know, a swipe test, make sure there's no spill and everything. So that's during the experiment. And in terms of afterwards, when we inject that either into animals or patients, when we inject into animals, typically we inject a very small amount because the PET imaging that we're doing is actually quite sensitive. So we just need a very little amount of dose for that. So the, when we calculate the say radiation dose by the imaging studies, generally speaking, they are much lower than the annual, like say the government has a certain limit of how much radiation dose you can receive a year, say in the, in the in the limbs, it's probably higher than in the, whole, in, in the main part of the body. And we are nowhere close to that. I mean, when we do the experiments for our own protection, we have the badge here to measure those. We mm -hmm. also have the badge on the ring, uh, on the ring to measure that. So for the worker perspective, there's really nothing because we read that uh, on a weekly or monthly basis and we're nowhere close to that limit. And in terms of animal studies, we inject certain amount. And that amount, when, when we calculate the dose, is actually also much, much lower 
then the required those. So it's and we can also extrapolate it say after if we collect the data over a certain period of time, we have multiple time point images of measure the fire distribution. We can use a software to extrapolate to potential human dose, say how much dose if we inject the same dose to a patient if we are translating. We measure the dose and then usually we want to make sure that's below the threshold dose of the normal people's dose. Uh, but for cancer patient therapy, sometimes it may have a little bit uh, higher threshold. So generally speaking, for everything we do here, if we're just doing PET imaging, generally speaking, you can do, well, typically for the clinical imaging, it's not just the PET. You really do PET CT. Like, uh, the CT is actually sometimes can give you much higher dose than the PET part. And then, so I think I would say for cancer patients, for example, you can probably do two or three PET CT scans a year, just for PET CT scans a year, without reaching the limit. So usually that's like less than five a year. For the therapy, you want to make sure the tumor gets enough dose, while the normal body uh, dose is much below, much lower below the safety threshold, so you don't have a bone marrow toxicity, liver or kidney toxicity. So for that, generally the very detailed and complicated dosimetry calculations by either medical physicist or some kind of modeling person to estimate the dose based on either human imaging data or based on comprehensive animal data. So you can base that on deciding, okay, what's the maximum dose we can inject to the patient to not cause toxicity. So all of those, there are multiple levels of a calculation or multiple levels of like estimation to make sure there's no toxicity. And also generally speaking, when you do this kind of therapy in patients, imaging, we don't really worry about toxicity, it's nowhere close. For therapy, you need a much higher dose. Generally, you do a dose saturation study. You start, say, with 10 manicure, depending on what you are using. Start with one level, if just we measure the blood or all kinds of measurement. If there's no toxicity for the first phase one trial, you go up the dose, maybe 50% more or maybe two-fold of the dose. You go up until you see some toxicity and then they say, okay, this is the maximum tolerated dose. We're not gonna inject that. We're gonna go lower one level. So usually if it's done properly, we don't really worry about that toxicity. Yeah, that's kind of a very long answer, but yeah. It's, it's it's a lot of process. It's not very. It's not just a simple, you know, you inject certain things. Okay. Uh, can I ask yeah, another sure. question? Sure. Yeah. So, so now coming back to your fancy origami kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which you have shown it. Uh, you showed that uh, the shape of the origami structures have an impact on the stability wow. and the uptake as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, you showed that rectangular are the most uh, suitable for this yeah. the, in your studies. Right. I'm just wondering, uh, because they are DNAs, yeah. so stability is one of the key components when you are targeting this kind of, mm -hmm. for, for therapy kind of thing. And why not a close bundle kind of structure is more, more stable as compared to a flat rectangular one? I'm just wondering. Actually, the stability wise, they are probably similarly or equally stable. Okay. Uh, yeah, because of limited time, I did go into detail. So basically, in this, the initial thought of this is that okay, we're going to compare different sizes, different shapes, see whether there's any difference in bar distribution, and then we pick the best one for subsequent studies. So in that particular paper, we just tried those kind of three. Uh, we found okay, they are different enough. But later we found that you know, in terms of size range, they are kind of within the same okay? ballpark. Right, 100 nanometers or so. Mm. And what's really interesting is that this was purely wrapped. So it's like it's like a very well woven, high quality Persian carpet. Like, mm -hmm. It's all DNA. Nothing was exposed on mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. And somehow that escaped the recognition of the liver. Because you would expect 60 or 100 nanometers, you see a lot in the liver. But we did the multiple time point imaging, do the whole body imaging. We don't, we barely see anything in the liver. So it doesn't get recognized by the Kufa cells or the reticular endothelial system for some reason, which is something I don't have the infrastructure or the method to figure out why. But that did happen. <coughs> and I think in this case, the kidney accumulation is actually when it flows in the blood, in the kidney glomeruli, it's just kind of like a kitchen sink with a mess. You just grab it over there, right? Because it's, it's pushing. So that seemed to be the case. And when we did search literature, 
there are quite a few papers that are talking about the same thing. So if you have a 60 or 70 nanometer nanomaterials, somehow it got trapped in the kidney. So there are some literature evidence of other nanoparticles for that. So to make sure this is indeed the case, we, as I mentioned, we also did the rather, so this is a random loop. So essentially this, the, the other one is just a, the black component. There's no extra lip DNA anywhere. We could also design it so that half of them is folded perfectly, the other half just random coil with a loop there. And then that also goes to the liver, obviously. That's in the supporting material, not in this case. But for all three, when they are perfectly folded, they have very much the same part of the distribution. It's just that the kidney uptake might be a little bit higher or lower. They are not exactly the same level. So we found that the rectangular one has a better accumulation in the kidney. So we thought, okay, let's just move on with this one. Yeah. So stability wise, I think they are almost the same stability. I don't think there's any, we did the measure, say serum stability or whatever body fluid stability. We don't see a huge difference. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Um, also, also uh, regarding the origami structure, it's very interesting that uh, you actually have control to fold them in, in very nice complex shape. Yeah. So, so but the example you show here is a two-dimensional, right? So, yeah, that's so why. What about three-dimensional shape? Is it possible? I'm, I'm not in the field. Yeah. Just asking the question. Right? That's a great question. Uh, so let's see. When we started this, so the paper was published in 2018. I think we did the first experiment in 2015. Uh, so at that time, you know. Uh, at least in 2015, when we did this, we see almost zero paper about biomedical applications of this DNA organ structures. But those were all published in Nature of Science, you know, they can make all kinds of like, 3D structures. So we thought, you know, we have to start from the beginning, something that's easier. So we did not do the 3D structure. 3D structure we haven't had. We did apply for the NHL work grant for the DNA organ five or six times, so far we never got it. <laughs> so, so we haven't really done it. Let's say, for example, this kind of cube, uh, uh, cube structure or this kind of structure. If we have the volume, we can definitely test a few of them. I'm not sure how that's going to be. Because this might not be, I don't know, may not be as rigid as the one that I showed that three really structure. So I don't really know. Uh, that's the only thing we did so far. And then this is relatively okay, quite, quite rigid, I guess. So 3D ones, I don't really know. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, yeah, once we, you know, as we, two weeks ago we submitted another one on the DNA governance structure. So if we get funding, we'll definitely do something in that regard. It's a lot more, because this is kind of almost as simple as you can do, right? It's, it's, it's probably the easiest one to make. So we start, and we have to learn to walk before it came out. So we started with this one. So far, we haven't had any subsequent studies just yet. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask one just yes. ask yeah. question? Uh, you have shown a lot many organic uh, nanoparticles in your previous slides. Mm -hmm. Then you showed me this DNA origami. Yeah. Those nano, those one, the organic one, this is the biological one. What do you think? Which one is more for therapeutic purposes? Which is more good in terms of therapeutic purposes? You know, if we're talking about potential of translation into patients. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I guess you know biodegradable, or biomed biomedic, or something that's you know made from safe elements, say silicon nanoparticles, is generally regarded as safe by FDA. So I don't think people worry too much about toxicity, but say pollen dots or some other upcoming nanoparticles, those are definitely going to have a much harder time to be translated. All let's say polymers, biodegradable polymers, those are probably easier to translate and also live some kind of structures. So a lot of them can be, uh, while for us, part of the reason why, you know, we are kind of spread very broad <laughs> rather than focusing on one thing, digging deeper and deeper. Part of that is not because we don't want to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, nowadays, you know, nowadays the journals or reviewers or editors, they emphasize really um, not what they're saying, you know, ideally you want something that's brand new so you can get to a higher profile per papers. Once you publish one paper in that topic, then the second paper you're working on, it's getting harder to publish the same level. You just go one step lower. And then I guess I could also lose interest. My student postdoc could also lose interest. So we, it's not that I don't want to work on something and dig deep and deep, 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 so as deep as we want, but then the more the deeper you dig, the, the deeper you dig, in most cases, 
the worst paper it is because it's the second paper or third paper. Mm -hmm. So that's why we kind of uh, try to uh, uh, we try to survive on the on the on the proof as of multiple different fields, you know, maybe new nanoparticles targeting new disease model. You can see that's kind of what we are trying to do. So it's like a, it's an integration or synthesis of all oh, kind of multiple different perspectives to try to still maintain certain level of quality of publication. Yeah, so those are some of them. Are the, a lot of them, I think, we, if we have the resources, we could do a much better job. Uh, but then just feel like you know, lost interest. Because if we are talking about clinical translation, I do agree that yes, the simpler the better. That's why we spend a lot of time on the intrinsically radio label and the materials to make it as simple as it possible it could be, so that it could translate for them. But then the vast majority of like when you want to publish a good paper, unless it's a really great idea, it's very hard to publish simple stuff on a good journal. So we try to go fancy uh, sometimes. So we try to we try to do it do both ways, like, but it's very hard to have those two align with each other. That's that's what I found. Definitely, it's quite quite relatable in the science. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so for many different, sometimes we do a lot of experiments for different reasons, and also sometimes we don't do the same experiment for almost the same reason. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much.